It is such an honor to be with you today. And um, Dr. Wagner, I just have to say that was the most inspiring and touching presentation that I have seen in a very, very long time. Um, so I want to thank you again for being here. And uh, who knows, I, I see some parallels in some of you know, the common work that we're all doing here. And um, perhaps you'll see something of potential value for your clinic of bio, with biofield therapies. So we'll see. How many of you are familiar with this term, biofield therapies? Couple, okay, a good number actually, that's great. Well, for those of you that aren't, um, try to describe it a little bit because this particular modality in the field of complementary and alternative medicine or integrative medicine um, is particularly challenging for those who are allopathically trained um, and trained here in the United States in terms of research to understand um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So what, what are biofield therapies? They're complementary medicine therapies that involve the intentional um, alteration or work with what's called the subtle energy body or the subtle energy field to elicit a healing response. Pretty straightforward, right? Everybody understands that? Um, you know, I know we're short on time, but since some of us aren't that familiar with it, I'm just going to do a very quick exercise to give you a sense of what we might mean by biofield. And this is by no means exhaustive, exhaustive or explanatory of what we mean by biofield, but it does give us a, at least a, a, literally a palpable sense sometimes of what we mean by this. So if I could in, indulge uh, you in to uh, just drop your pens or phones or whatever you might have in your hand, rub your hands together pretty vigorously if you can. Just go ahead and rub them together very vigorously. <clears throat> Great, and then um, if you will, just sort of hold them just a little bit apart from each other. And then perhaps move your hands back and forth, kind of close together, far apart a bit. And notice if you feel anything at all. You may feel nothing, you may feel something. There's no right or wrong, um, but I'm curious, what do you experience? Does someone want to shout out something if they do experience something? Sorry? A force inward? I heard magnetic. Change in the temperature of the air between your hands. Pull between the hands. Anything else? Resistance between the hands. Yes, the chi ball, so to speak. So now let's try something interesting. Rub your hands close together again, just for a second, then turn to a person next to you and have them put their hand in between your hands. And just play with that, move it around a little bit. Did it feel any different? Did it feel similar? So what is that like? It's probably different from what you experienced the first time. Some people don't feel much at all, it's, it's, and some people feel something slightly different from what they felt before. Anybody want to shout out uh, any experiences that they had? You could feel something and it was different. It was different when your hands were between hers and when her hands were between yours. So this is interesting. This gives you a sense of what we mean by this idea of the biofield. And I bring it up too because, you know, notice your hands weren't touching in this case. One of the things that absolutely drives people crazy about this field is that a lot of the things that are done in the biofield area are actually done hands off. And a lot of people have a hard time understanding how this could render any potential effect whatsoever. So just, to, just sort of an introduction to give you a sense of what we mean by biofield. Again, not at all exhaustive. So what are some examples of therapies that are used um, to enhance the biofield? You might have heard of some of these. They're like Reiki, her healing touch, therapeutic touch, Joe Ray, pranic healing, the, um, the ancient laying on of hands, 
Um, there's so many names. External Qigong is also part of this. What's interesting is there has been this practice in almost every culture around the world, whether it was from the Judean Christian culture, the Asian cultures, nearly every medical system, in fact, at least the ancient medical systems, understood this practice and used it um, to facilitate healing in patients. So, thinking about what we know about biofield therapies now, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of um, some of the work that's been done in this area and our, our research synthesis of it. Um, the highest known patient users of biofield therapies include cancer patients and cancer survivors, also a lot of patients who suffer from chronic pain and patients in palliative care. And if you ask patients why they use it, they'll say they often use it to reduce their pain, enhance their well-being. And there's this belief that it stimulates the immune system. And up until recently, very little work even done in this area to potentially substantiate any of these anecdotal claims. So what does the evidence actually success, uh, suggest? Well, in 2010, Paul Mills and I um, published a review on this topic where we reviewed 66 clinical studies of biofield therapies, including randomized controlled trials, but not limited to them. Um, and that study is out if you'd like to look at it. What we found was that there are medium methodological qualities, so contrary to popular belief, they're not all horrible studies. Um, actually, there was strong evidence for reducing pain intensity in pain populations, moderate evidence for reducing pain intensity in hospitalized populations and cancer patients moderate evidence for decreasing behavioral symptoms of dementia, moderate evidence for anxiety, and mixed evidence at that time, at least, um, on symptom, other symptoms in cancer, such as fatigue, depression, and things like that. <clears throat> so again, this was a systematic review, similar to a meta-analysis, um, but not a meta-analysis, because there was so much heterogeneity, as you can imagine, in this sample of studies. And there are other ones out there as well, in terms of the systematic reviews that might be useful if you want to get a sense of the literature as a whole. So then the question is, okay, there's some evidence to suggest that this is helpful for some patients. How in the world does it work? And of course, it depends on where you're looking, right? Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've been looking at this in the traditional Western medical model and uh, the Western scientific paradigm to try to understand how these therapies, if they do seem to be working, how they could potentially have their effects. So we'll just skip to the heart of the controversy. There are no needles. There are no supplements. In many cases, there's no touching. So how is this happening? And this is why this, this field has been so challenged and, um, and why it's honestly very difficult to get funding to do this kind of work, um, because it's very much based on the theory and there's no, you know, there's no way to really avoid discussing the fact that this is based on this idea of energy fields. What's interesting is the idea of subtle energy fields, as you may know, um, is pretty inherent in the traditional um, medicine approaches, such as traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurveda. In fact, the idea of working with subtle energy is very much a part of mind-body practices, as they're called in this country, like yoga, meditation, and qigong. So actually, the theory of subtle energy is pretty much in almost every complementary medicine modality that you might encounter here in the United States. Um, but it's, of course, not studied that way. It's not discussed that way. We tend to look at mind-body effects, meaning cognitive effects, relaxation response, placebo effects, and things like that. Interestingly, now, the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, which is the NIH-funded center to um, dispense research dollars to fund these sorts of things, has now put biofield therapies in the mind-body um, modality, which is a, is a kind of interesting place for it to be, I think. So if we th the, one of the reasons that I've been so interested in this is I think it's a, it's a perfect type of modality for us to explore salutogenesis or the healing response. If we look at these just couple of different domains that we might think are important in understanding healing, and then we look at how people have been looking within these domains to understand biofield therapies, what we find is mostly we've been focusing on the interpersonal and the psychophysical. Um, even though contextual, social, spiritual aspects probably play a role here, play a role in healing regardless, no doubt, we tend to focus on these domains. If we think about some of the potential systems that might be involved in biofield healing, these are just a, a few. So the context is important. The culture, for example, that the person has come from, the culture that you know, the therapies are embedded in, patient-practitioner interaction, placebo elements such as expectation, response conditioning, relaxation. There are studies that actually have examined what are called, what could be called direct effects of the biofield on physiology, meaning non-human, cellular studies, 
Um, I won't have time to go into that today. And then, of course, a way to, and, and a need to be able to tap the spiritual or potentially different experiences that people have when receiving such therapies. But again, by and large, this is where we've been focusing. So talk a bit about the placebo issue. Um, and this is really no different um, for biofield as it is for things like acupuncture and whatever. So honey, go and talk to him. He's just found out he's a placebo. So we have this, this sense of shame about our complementary medicine therapies that if all we're offering is just placebo, then you know, it must not be worth very much, which is quite funny, actually, if you think about it. It's, it's completely backwards. Um, but we have you know, been tasked with this idea of putting these types of of therapies in randomized controlled, placebo controlled trials to try to demonstrate that these types of therapies have any effect over and above what are called placebo elements. So what, what does a placebo design look like for something like a biofield therapy? Um, and I'm setting you up here because I'm going to talk very specifically about a study that we did that employed this type of design. What is it actually doing? Well some of the things that you can do with a so-called placebo design and what we mean by this is for example, a mock healing kind of design, and I'll describe what that looks like later. What are we looking at? We're looking at patient-practitioner interaction, expectancy effects, conditioning effects, potentially touch effects themselves. If you talk to a biofield healer, though, you're really controlling for the biofield when you do something like that. Well, probably not. Um, as you experienced with your hands, and you may or may not be a biofield healer, the biofield is in existence. So what you're really looking at are the effects of intention and the effects of practice when you're comparing, say, a Verum biofield healer with a, quote, mock healer who is still a human being. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this study that uh, was recently published in the journal Cancer. And again, want to thank Cancer for, um, for actually uh, having the courage to publish this study. They did receive a lot of flack after we published it. Um, this study was funded by NIH, um, as well as Samueli Institute, as an extramural grant before I actually came on with them. Um, this was my dissertation study, actually, while I was here at UCSD. Um, we also received a lot of support from the General Clinical Research Center here at UCSD, where we conducted the study. They helped also pay for some of the assays, and really was a very positive experience conducting the first healing study that was ever done here at UCSD. I want to acknowledge everybody who really made the study happen, including my mentor at the time, Paul Mills, who's in the Department of Psychiatry here at UCSD. <clears throat> so this is where, Dr. Wagner, I'm particularly inspired by your talk, because if you can come up with the solutions that you've come up with, then certainly we should be able to come up with solutions for cancer-related fatigue. And sadly, we haven't yet. Um, and as Many of you probably know it affects at least 30% of individuals who go through cancer, not just breast cancer survivors, um, but really almost all cancer survivors. We still don't have an answer for why this happens, why it happens to particular people, and what we can do about it. It's really a serious problem. It really interferes with daily functioning and quality of life in these patients, and they're well through with treatment. What we do know um, is that there do seem to be immune and hormonal alterations in cancer-related fatigue. Um, it's thought currently that the dysregulations in the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis might help to perpetuate this issue. Um, an example of that is decreased diurnal cortisol variability, which is a fancy way of just talking about the changes in cortisol over the day. So normally what happens with cortisol is um, it slowly rises during the nighttime, and about 30 minutes after you wake up, it peaks. Then it slowly kind of goes down during the day. So that's the variability that you see in your cortisol rhythms throughout the day for a normal, healthy person. And that's important because cortisol um, regulates all kinds of functions, including the inflammatory immune system. Um, so there is you know, a, a, an inhibitory feedback loop that happens there. What we do know is that there is actually a decrease in this variability, meaning slopes actually get flatter for patients that have um, high levels of cancer-related fatigue and depression. And this appears important because flattened slopes have also been linked to mortality in breast cancer patients. So it seems to be an important and relevant biomarker. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the study now. The primary focus was really to look at a biofield healing modality and see if it could offer any benefit for cancer-related fatigue. And many people asked me, why are you studying this kind of more far-out thing here? Of all the complementary therapies, why aren't you looking at mindfulness or yoga or something like that? Well, I spent some time with these patients, and what they would tell me is, 
You know, I used to have a really regular exercise practice or yoga practice before this all happened. Now I'm so exhausted, I just can't seem to get going with anything, not even my regular self-care. So from a clinical point of view, these women are, fa are fairly exhausted. They really need to receive. The idea is that their vital energy systems may be depleted and really need to be boosted up so that they can engage in the self-care practices that they were used to. So that was sort of the theory behind why we chose this modality for this particular problem. So the secondary um, aims for the study were to examine this role of placebo elements, things like belief in socio-contextual factors on outcomes. So we randomized these patients to three groups, biofield mock or a weightless control. Um, it was a randomized control trial in every sense of the word. Our sessions were done in silence. The sessions were done at the General Clinical Research Center. Um, they had two sessions a week for a month, so relatively short intervention, actually. Um, this all took place here at UCSD in the General Clinical Research Center. The mock, um, I'll just say a minute, uh, say for a minute a, a bit about the mock therapy here. So these were skeptical scientists who had no experience in biofield therapies or related disciplines like martial arts, tai chi, yoga, meditation, things like that. Um, they were skeptical in the true sense of the word, they were open. They didn't care one way or the other whether this worked or not. They weren't anti it, they weren't for it, they were getting paid, they were happy to be there. We trained them, <laughs> we trained them in the hand position, so this was a hands-on modality, unlike some that were hands-off. Um, I chose this by consulting with Rosalind Bruyere, who many might know as a grandmother of healing, um, and has been doing work in, in healing and in studies of healing for many, many decades, and I asked her which technique she would recommend. And she recommended something called energy chelation, which essentially looks like um, the person is lying down fully clothed, the practitioner puts their hands first starting at the feet, so they're touching their fully clothed body on the feet, there's no massage involved, there's no manipulation, um, just to an outside of observer, very light touch, starting with the feet and then working their way up the body to the hands. So it was relatively simple, actually, to train the mock healers in this. We also trained the mock healers on things like, you know, how to field questions if they came up, how to be credible and convincing, um, for example. One of the reasons that we had the sessions done in silence was to minimize, you know, any potential issues of interaction or unblinding that could happen with a mock group. So what did we look at? We looked at fatigue. We looked at depression, we looked at quality of life. We also had them rate after each session what they thought they got. So even though they were with the same practitioner every single time, sometimes people's minds could change about what they thought they were receiving. So we asked them to rate after each session, did they believe they were getting um, hands-on healing or what we called touch alone? We also had them rate things like how friendly they thought their practitioners were, um, how connected they felt, and how much they felt like this therapy was helping them with their immunity, well-being, and fatigue. We looked at diurnal variation of, of cortisol, looking at salivary cortisol over multiple time points during the day, and we also looked at inflammatory markers in oxytocin. So I talked a little bit about this. The, um, the idea behind energy chelation is that um, it is stimulating the person's own vital energy and helping to reduce toxicities in the body, thus the term energy chelation. This particular technique has actually been incorporated into other modalities like healing touch and therapeutic touch, and I believe to a degree Reiki. So again, for the mock healers, we asked them not to intend to heal, and I'll tell you a little story about that in a minute, um, but we asked them not to intend to heal, um, but to literally go into planning mind. Think about their papers, their projects, their grants, things like that. So in other words, induce a small state of anxiety in them as they were working on their patients. But I'll tell you, one of the reasons I think this is interesting to bring up, I mean, when people have done these sorts of mock studies, you know, mock acupuncture has its own issues. Here, the question is whether you can really control for intention. So once we were done with the study, we had a little get-together to celebrate, and my husband asked um, one of the practitioners, the mock practitioners, well, what was it like to sit there with a cancer patient that you made a connection with over a month's time and put your hands on them and not, you know, intend to heal? And she said, well, don't tell Shamini. <laughs> But, you know, at the end, I just sort of let whatever happened happen, right? So can you really ask a human being not to intend to heal when they're with another person that they have a connection with? It's a good question. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the results now and uh, just a, a little bit about um, how we analyze this using a technique called hierarchical linear modeling, um, which I can talk about later if anyone's interested. <clears throat> 
So were we successful? Did blinding occur? Well, yes, overall 75% of them thought they were getting healing. Um, and there were no significant differences between the mock and healing group on things like how friendly they thought their practitioner was, how much they believed the therapies were helping them, things like that. So here are results for um, fatigue. What we found was a profound drop in fatigue down to really preclinical levels um, using the MFSI, a very well-validated um, score. So there are the white bars that you see are the healing group. So you can see the drop. And this is nice, it actually gave you a sense of dose response. So after two sessions, you can see how much the drop was and that it continued. Unfortunately, we didn't have follow-up in this data, um, which I hope to do in the next study. This is the mock group. The mock group was also significantly different from the weightless control group. Again, you see some pretty substantial decreases in fatigue, not as much as the healing group, and this is not statistically significantly different. Um, but from the clinical perspective, what we could see is for the mock group, you ended up having drops in fatigue that ended up being about what you would expect for a breast cancer patient pre-chemotherapy. And in the case of the healing group, you had drops in fatigue that were really um, of the normative population. Okay, so both really substantial. Were there any real differences? Well, what we did find was that uh, the general fatigue subscale, which happens to be the most reliable and valid subscale of this MFSI comprehensive measure, um, there was actually significant differences between biofield and mock. Um, but on the full subscale, there were not. So I'm going to show you a slightly busy slide, but one that I think is really fascinating. When we looked at quality of life and we looked at to see what predicted it, group status initially predicted it, that is, you know, biofield versus mock versus weightless control. But then when we added belief as a predictor variable, what we found was belief in whether you thought you were receiving healing or not was really the major predictor of quality of life. And so what you see here is the depiction of a three-way interaction, um, but in truth, it was really the two-way that was significant, so that this is the healing group that believed they were getting healing. This was the mock group that believed they were getting healing. These were the groups that basically, regardless of which group they were in, if they didn't believe they were getting healing, they really didn't show an effect on quality of life. So very pr provocative. And I think this is really important because quality of life is a huge and very important measure in cancer. It's used in every clinical trial for good reason. It's prognostic, sometimes more than biomarkers. Um, and yet we never think to ask the patients whether they believe that what treatment they're getting, regardless of whether it's biofield or a drug, is helping them. So perhaps we should be looking at belief factors as predictive. Talk a little bit about the cortisol. Again, this is the cortisol rhythm. This is a normal cortisol rhythm that you would expect to see in a healthy individual. So we're, right now what we're looking at basically is this diurnal slope. How flat the slope is um, or you know, how steep the slope is. So a more negative slope in this case means more variability, which is indicative of a more healthy state. What we found, interestingly, was that the, uh, the biofield group, compared to both the mock and um, the control group, showed steeper slopes that is a more regular um, cortisol rhythm over time uh, compared to you know, both mock and, um, and, bio and, uh, and healing. I mean, sorry, compared to both mock and the weightless control. So this was very provocative um, because belief didn't predict this. Other placebo factors didn't predict this. This seemed to be something very unique to biofield healing. And we don't have a clear explanation for why that is, although we have theories. So just to summarize what we found here, significantly reduced cancer-related fatigue, which was our primary outcome. In terms of quality of life, belief was really the sole predictive factor. Now, I mentioned that we looked at depression. We found no changes in depression for this study. And, um, my theory on that is actually because the study was done in silence. There was no discussion of things that were taking place in the individual. Um, so a little bit of an artificial, and I wonder if we had actually had uh, therapies where there was talking between the practitioner and the patient, whether we would have seen differences in depression there. And interestingly, we found this specific effect on cortisol variability for the biofield healing group. So it appeared that this particular therapy was efficacious for, for uh, cancer-related fatigue. And when we look at the placebo factors, what we find is that, you know, potentially, if you look at the, the sizable differences for the mock group in fatigue, while belief didn't particularly predict fatigue, things like common sense things like being touched, resting, interacting, 
um, may actually have a significant role, and yet the biofield healing suggests that there's something above and beyond those factors that might be influencing fatigue. Belief is a very important factor in quality of life, and um, we need to look more deeply into what um, might be happening with the biofield and cortisol variability. So what's the clinical relevance of this? Well, in highly reduced cancer-related fatigue in a population where there's no gold standard treatment, um, it, has a, it had a very large effect size, which of course would need to be replicated, but uh, larger than I've seen for other complementary or behavioral medicine approaches in this population. There were no adverse events reported, suggests a high benefit to harms ratio, very low attrition rate. I mean, these women really, they came in, they had their blood drawn, they were, you know, it was pretty um, intensive. They were coming in twice a week, but um, they loved this. Even the folks that were in the mock group, they actually really appreciated being in the study. So a bit on meaning. Um, alternative therapy should be included as part of cancer treatment, touch healing, acupuncture, biofeedback are as important as surgery, chemo, and radiation. Post-treatment fatigue is a very real problem. I'm grateful that it's being studied and I was a part of it. I wanted to talk a little bit about a study that um, Sue Lukendorf, a colleague of mine, did just to let you know that there are other studies that are being done in this area beyond just for survivors and cancer-related fatigue. We don't have a ton of time to go over that today, so I'm just going to highlight this um, this was another study that was published in a very high-level journal, Brain Behavior and Immunity, where she looked at healing touch for cervical cancer patients during chemo radiation. And um, so we don't have a ton of time. We'll just show you some of her results here. She found um, preservation and natural killer cell cytotoxicity over time for the healing touch group compared to relaxation and usual care. She also found a decrease in depression for the healing touch group um, with a clinically significant change in depression there. Um, so there are criticisms of this work, and I wanted to just speak to that a little bit because I think it's important to acknowledge what the criticisms are and, and, um, and how we work with those. So uh, James Coyne wrote a letter to the editor uh, to Cancer once the study was published saying publication of this therapeutic touch trial, this was actually not a therapeutic touch trial, but that's okay, um, encourages more pseudoscientific studies of energy fields or auras and gives the wrong message to uh, clinicians and patients. Another well-known skeptic, um, I don't know if some of you might have seen some of the articles that were published by the Tribune, both about complementary therapies and integrative medicine in general, and also on energy healing. Um, uh, very interesting. <laughs> and of course, they didn't consult with us on the study at all, but got sort of some quotes from, from the skeptics around it. So nothing new here. Um, but what's the potential fallacy? So we're not basing our decisions necessarily on what's happening for the patients, but on our belief systems, our own belief systems as physicians, clinicians, scientists, um, and this is a problem. Um, are we potentially missing the point? What should be informing clinical decision making? Should it be things like benefits, harm ratio, efficacy, effectiveness, things like that, or our own personal beliefs in the theoretical underpinnings of the therapy? We may never have a satisfactory answer using a reductionist Western paradigm of what biofield therapies are, but we certainly have an increasing number of evidence to suggest that these therapies are useful for patients, that patients like to use them, um, and in many cases the effect sizes are, are quite large. So hopefully patient-centered medicine is going to override fear-based reasoning. Um, to forward the field of integrative medicine so that at some point we no longer have the term integrative medicine, we simply have the best medicine. Thank you.